Well, thanks very much, Neve, and uh, apologies for keeping you waiting. I know you like to get these things going as quickly as possible, so um, bear with me on that uh, on this occasion, but it is my fault. It's not anybody else's. So, uh, uh, On behalf of HSBC and the Chicago Council of Global Affairs, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for the second program of our fall series on the global economy. HSBC has been pleased to support this important series over the last four program seasons at the Chicago Council. Many of you have attended our program with Robert Reich in October, and tonight we're delighted to welcome James Wolfenson to the Council. As many of you may know, Mr. Wolfenson was most recently at the Council when he was honored as the 2008 Global Leadership Awards Dinner. We welcome him back to the Council as a true embodiment of a global citizen and an undoubted example of a Renaissance man. Born in Australia, he represented the country both as a member of the Australian fencing team at the 1956 Summer Olympics in Melbourne and as an officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. He became a naturalised US citizen in 1980 and he has been part of both democratic and republican administration activities. Perhaps we could welcome you back to do that again, Jim. Um, he received an honorary knighthood from Her Majesty the Queen in 1995 for his services to the arts, and he is also an officer of the Order of Australia. I'm sure he'll be watching the cricket in the coming week, for those of you who follow it. It's not going too well for Australia. Uh, <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist that. <laughs> It's not often we're on the, on the, on, we have the upper hand in these uh, battles. Uh, his commitment to the arts is personal. Perhaps not everyone knows that after Jim began the study of the cello in his early 40s with his friend, the legendary Jacqueline Dupre, he performed for his 50th birthday with her at Carnegie Hall, followed by repeat performances there on subsequent milestone birthdays with the likes of Yo-Yo Ma and Bono. Not too bad for an ex-banker. <laughs> Certainly much better than I could do, I know. Uh, Jim Wilfonson's career has indeed spanned the globe, taking him from the world's financial centers to more than 120 nations, including the world's poorest, where he has been committed to addressing the issues of international development and poverty. As much of the world continues to navigate through a time of economic uncertainty, I look forward to hearing his views on the global economy as we define the new normal in the wake of the financial crisis. James Wolfenson served two terms as president of the World Bank from 1995 to 2005. Upon leaving the World Bank in May 2005, Mr. Wolfenson served as special envoy for Gaza for the Quartet on the Middle East. In 2006, he founded the Wolfenson Center for Development at the Brookings Institute, which seeks solutions to key development challenges throughout the world. His book, A Global Life, My Journey Among Rich and Poor, From Sydney to Wall Street to the World Bank, will be available for purchase and signing following the program. Please join me in giving a very warm Chicago welcome on a very cold day to James Wolfenson. Jim. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Neil, uh, for reading the introduction that I prepared. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you left out a couple of lines, but you did pretty well. <laughs> um, I'm very happy indeed to be, to be back here and uh, remember very well the honor that I got a couple of years ago, and, and uh, I'm delighted to have the chance to come back and to talk to you about <clears throat> my views of the global economy uh, at this time. It would have been more difficult to talk about it two years ago, as I'm sure you know, <clears throat> because that was at the time of the crisis. I was here uh, with the former president of Ireland, uh, and she and I were sort of trying very hard to put on an optimistic face in a very difficult time. And uh, it gives me a chance now to reflect on that, but I've been asked more particularly to try and project forward and talk a little bit about 
what I see in the future. And, uh, and then, of course, to open it for questions uh, on subjects that I uh, don't adequately cover. I think the most important thing to say uh, at this moment is that in the two years since my last visit here, there has been a recovery. Uh, we have seen that the dire predictions of the world ending uh, were not fulfilled, thank God. And in various different ways, we've seen growth recommencing uh, on our planet. But it is a very different growth than the one that I grew up with and that for looking around the room that many other people here uh, grew up with. Because for the period from 1960, 1970 through to the year 2000, my generation became used to the situation that the billion people that there were in, 20, in the year 2000 and the half of that number in 1950, that this five billion people uh, that were in the developing world <clears throat> had 20% of the global income and the billion people of which I spoke had 80%. And this relationship of 80-20 uh, was there plus or minus 3% for a period of 30 to 40 years. And the G7, as you know, the United States and the European countries and Japan, uh, came to the view that they were at the very center of the universe. And uh, the G7 uh, felt dominant, really. And it was dominant in economic terms, not in terms of the number of people, nor uh, dominant in terms of history or culture, but they were pretty self-satisfied, I must tell you. I had the privilege of being at the first meeting of the G7 in 1997 as president of the World Bank when Jacques Chirac uh, decided that he would invite a few of these, uh, these less fortunate people to come to the meeting. And so he invited some six or seven developing country uh, leaders to join a meeting that was held in France. And the first person to speak was the president of China. Uh, the second person to speak was the prime minister of, um, of India. And the third person to speak was uh, the newly elected president of Brazil, and who's now just left the job. Uh, and he got up and he said, uh, they were each given 12 minutes uh, to speak to express the views of their country. And he got up and he said, um, how proud he was to be there with the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of England and the Chancellor of Germany and the Prime Minister of Japan and he repeated all these names and uh, said that if his mother had seen him there she would have been very proud to see her little boy uh, in that group. And then he said, um, he said, but may I suggest to you that instead of meeting in France, uh, again in a couple of years, why don't you come and meet in Brazil? And the reason I'm saying it, he said, is because in 10 to 15 years, five of the seven of you are not going to be in the G7. Uh, and we will be, and you won't be. And so you might want to get used to this. And everybody laughed. Uh, but the truth is, as I think you know, that when uh, the crisis occurred uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the G7 met, but very quickly, under the guidance of former President Bush, it became the G20, uh, because it was essential that to deal with the questions that there were on the planet, uh, that it was not any longer a G7 issue, or indeed a G8 issue with uh, Russia joining them. It was a G20 issue, because there was no way that the G7 uh, could stabilize the problem, and that it was essential because of the dynamics of the world uh, to become aware of the fact that the world was bigger than the billion people in the G7 countries, and that the five billion plus in the developing world were going to be by 2050, eight billion, and that the G7 uh, group, or the G30, as it uh, were, the, the group of the OECD countries, wouldn't be a billion, there'd be about a billion one. And so the dynamics were that come 2050, as it will happen, <clears throat> more or less you'll have eight billion people in what we used to call the developing world, 
and we'll have a billion, 100 million in the rich world. At least that's what we used to call it. But the significance of this evening is that it's really important to understand that that frame of reference that I grew up with and that I think some in the audience did is no longer relevant because the world is changing. And the world is changing at a pace that is really quite remarkable. If you look at the uh, GDP, the uh, income of the world last year, uh, it grew at a sort of average of 4%. Uh, and of that, 2% was the growth in the so-called rich world, and 8% was led by China and India and developing countries. And the net effect was it wasn't the rich world that was driving it along, it was the developing world. And of course, you're here at the invitation of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, with whom I had a very, very long association, and they helped pay for my children's education because I bought for them, you may not know this, the Midland Bank and the Marine Midland Bank. You were a child at the time, I think. Uh, but but uh, the truth of the matter is that the dynamics have moved eastward. And we're looking at a world now where by 2050, in 40 years' time, that 80% that used to belong to the G7 will be 35%. In fact, the G7 will be down to 25%. And all the OECD countries, which used to be 80%, will be between 30 and 35%. And 65% of the income of the world will be in Asia. And of that, 45 to 50% will be in two countries, China and India. This is something that really needs to sink in because most of us go along thinking about what are the short-term problems in the United States, how can we regenerate the activities in the United States, how can we deal with the question of trying to re-stimulate the economy and what are we going to do about the budget deficits and all those things which I'll talk about in a minute. But it has to be conceived of within the context of an historic change. It's a change of really monumental proportions. And if you travel in China or if you travel in India, you can see it. You, you don't have to go to Beijing and Shanghai and come away feeling that this is uh, the old China that I first went to in the mid-70s. The old China was a place where everyone sort of looked alike, and as a foreigner going there, uh, you had kids following you around because they'd never seen a European. That was mid-70s. Uh, that is no longer the case. In fact, the most modern city that you can see, in fact, is in many ways uh, part of both Beijing and Shanghai. And India is, with some years behind, five to eight years maybe, is on its way to becoming, very probably by 2050, a country that will be even larger than China. The, the economic forecast is vary whether China will be ahead or India will be ahead. But you're talking about a rough equivalence, and between them they'll have 45 to 50 percent of the global GDP. Now let's make the assumption that the the assessments are incorrect, that we're off 5 or 10 percent in the assessments. And it's not 2050, it's 2060. And it's not 65 percent of global GDP in Asia, it's 55 percent. I'm not looking for mathematical accuracy, I'm looking for the fact that you're having tectonic shifts in the way the world is moving. And we in the United States, and I must say more generally in the Western countries, are refusing or at least not looking at the extent of this change which will and is happening. The thing that really sticks in my crawl most particularly is that there are some 350,000 young Chinese studying abroad at university level each year. 350,000 or thereabouts Indians studying abroad each year. We have roughly 100,000 Chinese and 100,000 Indians studying at American universities. 
And if any of you have kids or go to graduations, as I try to do once every year to, for whatever reason I get invited, but I, I, I do go to these things with a particular interest. I got an honorary degree this year in the South at the leading university in the South. And when you see the PhD candidates stand up, the majority are Chinese and Indian. They're no longer American. This is the way the world is moving. And it is something that my generation maybe doesn't have to worry about, but worse than that, doesn't very often fully appreciate. And our kids are not responding adequately. With the 100,000 odd Chinese studying in this country, we have 13,000 Americans studying in China and 3,100 in India against the 100,000 from each of those two countries of 350,000 that are studying abroad. I've just come back from Australia. There are between 40 and 50,000 Chinese and Indians each studying in Australia. It's become the third largest industry in Australia is education because of the inflow from Asia. This is a different world. And so when I was asked to talk about the subject of the global economy and what's happening, you have to put it within the context of this changing balance, this changing pattern. Now as to finance, the developing world, as you know, very broadly, has most of the reserves at this moment. Of the nine to ten trillion dollars of reserves that there are in central banks, more than two and a half trillion are in China. Two and a half trillion of the ten trillion. And if you look at, if you go down the list with the exception of Japan, which has about a trillion, thousand billion that is, all the other countries are developing countries as we used to know them before you reach number 11. Our country is somewhere down 18th or 20th in terms of, of reserves. Now that is the world that we're, we're looking at. By the way, number three or four is Russia with 500 billion. So I'm not throwing numbers at you to give you the feeling that I've actually looked them up. I'm giving you the numbers to try and make you recognize that the world in which we're living is very different than the world in which we grew up. And the world of the next 30 to 40 years is going to be a very different world than that world in which we grew up. And for our kids and for their children, the orientation has to change from going and doing their postgraduate studies or the year abroad in France or in Germany or even in Latin America and be thinking about Asia because Asia is where the economic activity is already and is going to be. It used to be true that in terms of manufacturing, we could do it. That shifted to Asia. It used to be true that in terms of technical activities, we would be ahead. It was in California or it was around the developed world. That is no longer true. And the third thing that used to be true that was in terms of innovation and in terms of discovery, we were at the cutting edge. That is also no longer true. We have areas of our country which are preeminent, and thank God they are, and some universities that are preeminent. But they're no longer alone. And if you visit the, if you visit the centers in China and India, you become very much aware that they're replicas of what is going on on the West Coast. And usually the people in them are the same as the people that there are on the West Coast. But there are now these alternatives, and I think I've probably said enough to make you recognize that I think that the one thing that I think needs to be thought of as we look at this financial crisis is the context within which it's occurring whether it be in terms of existing resources or whether it be in terms of the dynamics in which we're moving. Now, the other thing that needs to be talked about is the issue of debt. Because uh, 
We talk in our country of adding a trillion and a half dollars to our debt load maybe this year. That is a lot of money. Um, even for someone who went to the Harvard Business School, it's a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money even for a Chicagoan. Uh, and it is something that is now happening with unerring regularity. And the question of what we do about debt is not something that you need to have a PhD. The truth of the matter is that as an individual or as a country, there is a limit to the amount of debt that you can have. I say this at the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank meeting, but even the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank puts limits on borrowing. And this is what is now happening in the world. And we're seeing that countries, including our own, are confronting the challenges and seeking to solve a lot of the issues by borrowing and then spending. And in the most recent interchange between the Congress and the President, who was looking to change the tax system and to make some changes, although consistent with his program of stimulation, which the Federal Reserve is just putting 600 billion into. The truth of the matter is that most of the other OECD countries are saying, let's take a more prudent view. Let's try and cut down the extent of our debt. And what we're finding is, and what we will find, is that at the moment the dollar is much favored or adequately favored even by China and India to put their money. But the truth of the matter is that if we keep on borrowing and within the next two or three years have debt equivalent to our income, debt equivalent to our income, and think of it in personal terms, debt equivalent to our income, that is not just an econometric number. <laughs> that is a real problem. It's a problem personally. It's a problem nationally. And it cannot go on. And if it goes on to have debts that are one and a half times your income, you're in deep trouble. This is not PhD economics. This is reality. And the problems are that what is driving our debts are many things, but included in that, health care and benefits in terms of retirement, which are building up to be close to 30%, or will be close to 30% of our budget. This is a extraordinarily difficult thing for us to think about. Because as with an individual, if you preempt 30% of your income, you're in deep trouble. And I'm not saying this to shock anybody. I'm simply trying to say that when we look forward in terms of our own country, there is a desperate need for us to take a look at the balance that we have gotten ourselves into. Now, it is possible, and indeed probable, that the GDP growth will grow from 2% to 3% to 4%, but it is at the moment 2% in our country. Maybe it'll get to 3 And we've probably got a period of years ahead of us where it's not going to break out very much. And what is needed to break it out is a fundamental look at our country. We have to get back and look at the education system. Our education system is appalling relative to what it should be. We used to be number one, number two, number four, number six. We're number 18 or 20 now in terms of comparative statistics. And I think many of you who are parents will know what the divisions are in the country. We still have some fabulous universities, including some in this region, but they can't deal with everybody. And I'm talking about the primary and secondary system. And at some point, our country has to wake up that the issues are not just this year 
and this year's budget. The issues are now strategic and are now medium and long term. And you cannot wait. You may be able to wait because of a two-year election cycle. But what you cannot do is solve the problem in two years. And I'm not here to try and get your attention with some sort of draconian outlook. But what I am trying to say is that our country really needs to look at fundamentals in terms of entitlements, in terms of education, in terms of how we compete. And this is something which uh, I regret to say we have not yet shown the maturity to be able to deal with. And in terms of the current political uh, balance or imbalance, the next two years is not likely to show from either side, I regret to say, the sort of strategic thinking that is necessary. And what is needed is people like you and groups like this to speak out, to really take a position, because it's no longer a game. In my judgment, it's the most serious moment that I've seen in my short lifetime in terms of the challenge, even more so than two years ago, where it was visible. The problem with this is that it's not immediately visible. And so we can go back and be comfortable again. But it is hugely important that we take not a two-year view, but we take a 10-year view about how we want to reshape our country, to get back the leadership in education, to get back the leadership in creativity, to get back the balance in terms of our budget to take a bit of pain today in order to give a future to our kids tomorrow. This is not just words. This is something that I frankly believe is totally essential uh, for our country. And then there's one other issue of many that I want to talk about, which is Africa. The projections are that by 2050, will have between a billion eight and two billion people in Africa. Today their per capita income is, depending on how you measure it, the most optimistic measurements would have you at twelve to fifteen hundred dollars per capita. And it actually feels a lot less in most of the 53 countries in which I visit. The projections are, the best projections are that by 2050, the average per capita income in Africa will be $4,000 per capita. And that's the best projection. That will be at a time when China and India will be between thirty dollars and $40,000 per capita. And when our country and the OECD countries generally will have between eighty dollars and $100,000 per capita. So you'll have two-ninths of the world at $4,000 per capita. You'll have China and India, which will be probably more than four nights of the world, damn near half the world, at thirty to forty thousand dollars per capita. And you'll have a billion people that are somewhere between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars per capita. Now, when Africans were running around with spears hunting and didn't have a clue what was happening in the rest of the world, maybe that would have been tenable. But for any of you that know Africa and visit, and I've just been there last week in four countries, the growing industry is uh, telecommunications and cellular radios and cell phones, which is a huge market. So information is available to everybody. Second thing that's available is transportation to get people out of the country. And the third thing, regrettably, which is available is that there are a lot of nasty people in the world who are looking for people that are vulnerable to do their work. That is unfortunately true. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to remind you that we live in a world which includes Africa. And most of us never give a thought to Africa, to the 900 million people that live there. But it is something 
of huge importance for our kids to think about because it's not just a matter of social justice. It's a matter of balance on our planet. It's a matter of peace. It's a matter of disruption. But it's also a matter of opportunity if we deal with Africa in a different way and if the Africans do. So where I come out on this is that we've had a tremendous run in our country. The OECD countries have had a tremendous run. There is a monumental change about to happen, is happening, where the 80% that we used to have is already down to 65%. And by 2050, it'll be down to 35%. Where the incomes and the weight of economic flows will be such that China and India will be number one and number two in terms of GDP, with the United States maybe three uh, at that time where Brazil will be number seven, where you'll see countries that you know very little about up there in the top 10, and where they will know a lot about us and our kids won't know a hell of a lot about them. That is not a good situation. But it is one that we can do something about. We have the creativity, we've got the educated people, we have the drive, we have a system that can bring about change if informed people want to see change. And that's something that I'm sure this group can affect, and it's something that I wanted to put before you. I'd like also to talk about environment, I'd like to talk about women's rights, I'd like to talk about lots and lots of things, uh, but I'm limited in time and I've already gone over by three minutes what I was allowed to do. So I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for taking an extra three minutes, but I thank you all for listening to what I've been saying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Now we'd like to open it up to the audience. If you could please raise your arm and wait for a microphone and make sure your questions are brief and questions. So we're ready to start. Um, over here, please. Uh, one second. You, uh, you, you spoke about the effect of uh, U.S. debt on our economy. Can you speak to the effect of rising interest rates and how that factors into the mix? Well, the, that is not the current problem. The current issue is that our government and the Federal Reserve have done everything possible to stimulate the economy so that in one sense we have negative interest rates at the moment. And we've gone as far as we can in terms of lowering rates in order to create a stimulus. You, you, can't, you can't go any further. And the reason that the Federal Reserve is coming in now with a stimulative package is because the only thing they can do is to stimulate with money. This will eventually change, but at the moment, the policy of our government is to try and stimulate the economy. And we've gone as far as we can on interest rates. So the issue is not raising interest rates at the moment, it's that we've lowered them as far as we can. And the stated objective of our government at the moment is to keep them down so that it will bring about a stimulus in the economy. I haven't thought for a long time about increasing interest rates in our country. Uh, and don't see it in the near term. I think the issue is, is how successful we can be with low interest rates and with priming the economy, as the Fed is now trying to do, to try and bring about stimulus. So uh, that's the answer that I would give you. Next question. Yeah, the young lady in the back with the glasses, please. What would you recommend to concerned, informed individuals that want to somehow do something about these problems but don't really know what to do or where to start? Well, I think talking to your representatives in government is something that's essential. And I think it's possible. They don't hear much. If they heard more, they might change their opinion. If they know what their people think, 
there's a fair chance that you can change their opinion. But in the absence of pressure on our elected representatives, you're not going to see change. So I just wish that we could do a lot more to talk to our congressmen and senators and try and bring about change. And for leading business people, of whom I know there are some in the room, delegations to see the President and the Secretary of the Treasury would, I think, be very helpful. I don't know what the results were of the meeting that was held today uh, at the White House. Uh, I haven't seen a report of it. But it would be my hope that the people that were there talked about this. If they didn't, it would have been a tremendously wasted opportunity. Uh, yeah, up the front here, John Simmons, please. One moment. Uh, Mr. Wilfinson, given the challenges that you have identified, what do you see as the World Bank's role going forward in working on these? Well, the World Bank um, has a defined role in terms of developing countries. It has no role in terms of the developed world, of the rich world, the, the 65 or the 70 percent of the world which is rich. They're concerned with the five billion people that are in development. But I have to say, since I was there, the challenge has changed. Because when I was there, uh, which started in 1995, <clears throat> my biggest client was China. And we would lend them $3 billion a year, and it meant something to them. And the second biggest giant was India. Well, today I don't think that it matters a hell of a lot to China whether they get $3 billion or not. They can do with some of the technical assistance that they have. I happen to be now on the board of the China Investment Corporation, CIC, an advisory board. And they have just invested or in the process of investing $350 billion outside the country. And I said to the minister on my last trip, when we run out of money, what are we going to do? And he said, well, we'll give you another $350 billion. Uh, I think that may have been a joke. So, uh, but the truth of the matter is that it is very different than it was even 15 years ago. So I think that the emphasis now has to be on Africa and on many of the poorer countries that there are. And there are 53 countries in Africa. It's a very inappropriate, in my opinion, it's very inappropriately governed in terms of what would be the most effective governance for Africa. And it would be my hope that at least we'll see the continent brought into four quartiles with the chance of bringing the 53 countries down to four groups and eventually have a pan-African coalition. But since you know Africa and many people here do, it's easier to describe that than to make it effective, unfortunately. Uh, next question, gentleman in the back with the red tie. Thank you, Mr. Wolfson, for speaking with us tonight. It's not working, sorry. Thank you for speaking with us tonight. Uh, my question is, what is your outlook on South America and Brazil more specifically. I'm studying abroad there this quarter, and I'm looking forward to getting your insights. Thank you. Well, I think Brazil is in a very, very good shape at the moment. It's quite evident that President Lula has done a remarkable job, and he's being succeeded by a lady who is making it now clear that she's not going to do everything the way that Lula did, uh, but that she will give continued leadership in the direction of trying to broaden the participation of Brazilians in the growth that there's been in that country. And as if you know Brazil, there are still many areas of the country which have not benefited from this economic growth. So you put a lot of money into infrastructure. And that over time, they have this remarkable benefit of hydrocarbon fines. But they're very, very deep. They're six times deeper than any other wells which have been drilled. So. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of hydrocarbon there, but it has to be brought out. And the country, as you know, has also done a pretty good job in terms of ethanol and in terms of trying to use even now solar uh, to lessen their dependence. But I was meeting with a group of Brazilians just the day before yesterday, 
And I said, when are you likely to uh, get the benefit in terms of exports? Because so much of it is going to be needed internally. And they gave me an estimate of 10 years. They think after 10 years, they'll be able to start doing some exports of hydrocarbons. I hope it happens that soon. But if it does, they have huge reserves. But there is the technical problem of getting to them. And that's not a trivial problem, uh, as I understand it. But I think you have to say that Brazil is in a very, very good position at the moment. And the other major power, of course, in Latin America, also represented in the G20, is Mexico, which has had a rough time for a whole variety of reasons, but not, a lo not, not least because of its proximity to the United States and the fact that the market here has diminished uh, significantly in the last years. Uh, next question. Over here, gentleman in the white shirt, please. This is like an economics examination. It's really, <laughs> it's really quite something. And I'm glad there isn't a professor here grading me. He'd know how fraudulent my answers are. <laughs> uh, sir, how does, how does the United States and the Western economies manage um, totalitarian states like the PRC gaming the economic system. There was a front page article in the, Wall Street, in the New York Times today about that uh, relative to wind farms. And secondly, um, in terms of the African continent, how does the West deal with the inefficiencies and the dislocations caused by corrupt regimes um, which, which exploit their own populations to the benefit of, you know, um, a kleptocracy. <clears throat> Let me deal with the second one first, um, because I made a, when I was at the World Bank, I, um, if I give you a little bit of background, uh, in my, after my first year, I said to a bunch of my colleagues, look, the key issue in Africa at the moment is corruption. Um, uh, we're pouring a lot of money in there. And of every $100 for a project, maybe $20 is getting to the project, and the rest is going in overheads and at least 20 25% in corruption. And I said, I really think I should make a speech about this. And the secretary of the bank asked to see me and then took me out of my office into a sort of open area. And he said to me, Jim, he says, you cannot use the C word. And I said, what the hell is the C word? And he said, corruption. And I said, why can't I use the C word? He says, do you realize that X percent of the members of your board are representing corrupt countries? And I said, well, to hell with them. And so the next, the next annual meeting speech, I talked about the cancer of corruption. Got tremendous applause, and the six months later in the semi-annual speech, every finance minister, every finance minister spoke about corruption and how they were fighting it and so on. The truth is that it is a major issue, and I think we've made some progress. Uh, you're aware of it at the, at the corporate level, uh, the impact it has. You're aware of the position taken by some American companies, which have cost them business. Um, but there is, I think, a growing feeling in the developing world that it's not tenable. But I say it's a growing feeling because you can still find it significantly in all too many countries, I regret to say. And in Africa, with 53 countries, average population size 20 million, uh, you have a real problem because a lot of the, when you say average 20 million, it means that a lot of the little ones are 1 million, 3 million, 5 million, and they all have a president, and they all have a finance minister, and they all have a central bank governor. And I would say that this is a serious long-term problem and will only be dealt with by the Africans coming together and Africans dealing with it. It will not be dealt with by lectures from foreigners. Of that I'm very clear. But there are a number of African leaders who understand the corrosive impact of it. And, and I'm, not, I'm not wholly pessimistic, but it'll take time. On China, um, what was the question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Look, I think China um, is an extraordinarily well-managed country. Um, it has changes of leadership which are projected years ahead. And the people that are going to be in the leadership have already had leadership positions below the top two positions for some time. I mean, our friends at the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank know this as well or better than I do. But it is a remarkably intelligently managed country, I think you'd have to say. And, but that doesn't mean that they don't have huge problems. Until three years ago, they were publishing the number of uh, events of public uh, displays or eruptions of 15 people or more. And when they got to 65,000 a year, 65,000 a year, they stopped publishing. And the last three years, so far as I know, they've not published the statistics. So it's not an easy country to govern. And with a billion, 300 million people, <laughs> it's just damn difficult. So I don't think that you can necessarily say that the growth of China will be smooth without bumps. I don't personally believe that that's probable. But in the near term, I think they've got it under control. And if you go there, and if you see the impact on the average people in the major cities, but not yet in, in some parts of the West, and not yet in some parts of the North, uh, you find that it is a remarkable achievement to have pulled so many people out of poverty and to have run the country in the effective way that they have. I, I, I think that the Chinese have done an extraordinary job, but no one has yet managed a billion, 300 million people uh, uh, with the pace of expectation that they have and the hopes that the people have and with the information exchange which is available. Um, we've seen what they can do when they don't want information going around, but that's, that has a cost. Uh, that has a cost. Uh, Chinese people are not stupid, and they can see uh, this. So my own judgment is that China is likely to have a period ahead of significant growth. India will as well. And I believe what I was saying, that the move in terms of economic growth is Asian for the foreseeable future. Uh, next question, the young lady in the back with the black top on. Uh, I was wondering if you could shed some light on um, the situation in Europe with the Eurozone and the recent uh, Greek financial crisis and the Irish bailout. And do you think that ultimately um, perhaps a dissolving the Eurozone would be advisable or would that make things in Europe worse? Look, the debate in Europe uh, at the moment is predominantly won by the leadership which says we have to keep the Euro together. And uh, I think they will do everything possible to do that. Uh, I don't think there is any sign at leadership level of a weakening of that stance. But the question is, will they be able to afford it? And how will they pay for it? And uh, the issue, I think, is less Ireland. The issue uh, will come with uh, some of the larger countries without naming them. Um, the difficulty of Europe is that it is a union, but it has no mechanism to bring about a coordinated approach to economic development because there is no central body which can tell people what they can and should do. And so you have this wonderful dream, uh, which when I started in it, there was a limit of 3% uh, uh, three percent to the amount of debt that should be accumulated in any single year. And of course, that's gone out the window in most every country. And you have these great diversions and, and divisions and, and distinctions between countries. But I think that the Europeans are trying very, very hard to keep it together and are prepared to take the pain to try and do it. And the rich countries, I think, at this moment, want to keep it together. 
I'm not sure that every German voter wants to keep it together uh, because it's at a cost. But I would say that the leadership at the moment is united. And so it would surprise me if in the near term you were to see a crack in the euro. Uh, I wouldn't want to see it, but I do think they have to do something about their internal management. Um, and that's very difficult when you have national sovereignty on those issues. Next question. Uh, uh, Alan Rich here in the middle. <coughs> I'd like to go back to uh, Asia, Please. and China and India, uh, which in some ways, at least from an outsider's vantage point, couldn't be more different. Uh, you talk about China being an extraordinarily well-managed country. Uh, India, from an outsider's perspective, is an extraordinarily poorly managed country, and yet succeeds despite that. Um, is my impression wrong, and, if it, and why is India succeeding? especially if it's not extraordinarily well managed? Well, I, I'm a bit of a bull on India. I think at the moment it is being rather well managed. I think Manmohan Singh, who is the Prime Minister, is a uniquely talented individual. And Montek Singh Alwalia, who is his planning minister, who is the deputy, who is actually essentially the planning minister, is absolutely first rate. Um, while they're there, I think you can be positive about India. But you're pointing to something which is absolutely clear, which is that the system in the countries couldn't be more different. In India, you have voting down to the panchayat level, which is the local village level. In China, there is no voting. <laughs> or if there is, it's done by the Communist Party, essentially. And it is a dirigist society run from the top. India is not. And the projections that most people come up with are that until 2025, the great growth is in China with a catching up from India. But most of the people who are looking at the future think that by 2050, you're going to get a real kick in China, in India, because of demographics and because of growth, because of greater infrastructure and because of the natural resources of the country. And who the hell knows what's going to happen in 2050, but I would say that the average projection, well, not the average, the most, if you, if you were to take the projections of 2050 by the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and everybody else, they would probably say that India will be ahead of China. Demographically, it'll be ahead of China because of the one-child policy. And in terms of growth, it'll hit in between 2025 and 2050. Now, I'm a great believer in democracy. <laughs> And so I actually think that it is a strength for India. That doesn't mean that you won't have some poor governments in that period of time. Even in our country, over the history, we've had one or two poor governments, um, I think, uh, without being uh, disrespectful. But there is an advantage in having a democracy because it tends to right itself. And in India, it is an extremely well-developed democracy. So I have a lot of faith in India. And uh, if you visit there now and you see the leadership of some industrialists and what's happening, it's really quite amazing compared to 15, 20 years ago. Quite amazing. Uh, Fred Isserman. <clears throat> I think we're holding people beyond the given time, aren't we? Oh. No, no. Are we right? We have, yeah, we just have about another seven minutes. Oh, we do? Oh, yeah. good. Okay. good. One question I'd like to ask you is one of the large expenditures of our country is for the military. And in effect, we've become the world policemen. I'm thinking specifically of the aircraft carrier that went to uh, Korea to calm that situation down. The other countries don't seem to want to participate in the same way. I gather we inherited that from the British after World War II. How do you get a more equitable participation in the world police? Well, I don't know that I have an easy answer for that. It is an issue which is long debated. 
if you want to, you can give it up to China, which is spending a great deal at the moment on defense and when aircraft carriers and submarines and everything else building up a huge navy. So if you want to make the decision that you want to give it to China, I think we're able to do it. I think that the reason that we're represented in these countries is not just because of trying to save those poor foreigners. I think it has something to do with our own self-interest. But the level of expenditure and the choices of expenditure, I think, are now being looked at a bit more carefully. Um, our late friend Dick Holbrook, who very sadly just died, uh, certainly had views on the subject on what could be done in Afghanistan, but Afghanistan is next to Pakistan. And you have to look at a nuclear power in Pakistan and you have to think about what is in America's interest in terms of the stability of the region. We are the global power at the moment. We can, we can give it up, but um, that's a pretty heavy decision for us to take. The question is, are we doing it in the most effective and efficient way that we can by being engaged in wars, which have been enormously expensive in the last decade? Um, I think the President has indicated that he'd like to get out of the wars, but still like to keep our position. And certainly the Secretary of State has been very active in presenting the United States position. But I have to say one thing about this, and that is that as the economics changes, and the United States moves from being the largest economic force in the world, to being less than the largest economic force in the world. With China and India moving ahead, we're going to have to face very different questions about what it is we want to see happening in terms of that changing economic dominance. So whereas once, after World War II, for example, we were the obvious choice to bring order to the world, that is becoming less reality but we have to look at our own economic situation and our own political situation and make decisions, but that probably is not going to be to engage in a lot more wars, which are very, very expensive. But uh, I'm a lousy politician, so I don't know what they will, what will be decided, but certainly the stated objective is to withdraw and to cut the expenditure. Yeah, in the back there, the gentleman with the pink tie. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, in, in your prediction, 2050, uh, China, India, and the United States will be first, second, and third, and Brazil seventh. But uh, in terms of population, China and India will be much larger than Brazil. So does that mean that Brazil will have a, a higher percentage growth between now and then? And yeah. the second question is, what will the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth countries be? <laughs> I don't remember is the answer to the fourth, fifth, and sixth. Um, but I can say that in terms of Brazil's growth, um, it is about two-thirds the rate of China and India and is projected even to be half the rate of China and India. But it is still moving ahead at a more active rate than most other countries, including the United States and essentially Europe, with the possible exception of Germany at the moment. So I think that, as I, as I said before, I'm not giving mathematical accuracy to this. I am convinced that by 2050, China and India are likely to be one and two ahead of the United States because of demographics and because of growth. If you look at the growth of China, just to give you statistics, if you have 8% growth, that doubles in uh, between 9 to 10% growth, which they have, it doubles every eight years. So in 25 years, that doubles three times, let's say. So it goes from one to two, two to four, four to eight. So China will be eight times, give or take, in 25 years what it is today in terms of income. Now I've said that maybe I'm off 
X years and that I'm off X percent. But the direction is clear and the numbers are very great. And the same is true of India, except that it cuts in later. So I am of the view that, um, that what I've described is likely to be the scenario and that of Latin America, Brazil, as part of the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, will in fact earn its place and probably rank number seven. That's my belief. I've obviously talked too much. Well, it, it just uh, falls on me to close the proceedings. But before I do that, uh, let me express some thanks. First of all, to Marshall Bouton, uh, to Neve King, to Dawn, to Rich, and all the people from the council and the people from HSBC, Loretta Abrahams and our team, uh, that put all this together. It's, uh, I know a lot of work goes into this, and I want to thank all of you for that. I'd also like to take this opportunity on behalf of everyone to uh, wish everybody here who's celebrating any kind of holiday going forward to, uh, you know, to wish you all the best for the holidays. Um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Jim Wilfinson. I, I didn't know Jim had done so much work for HSBC, and I'd personally like to thank him for bringing Midland to us, and I'm very glad he didn't actually admit to bringing household to us, which is a, a, very, a very different sort of proposition. Um, from my perspective, and um, you know, my view is, is not... Uh, anywhere near as grandiose as Jim's. I, I, I agree with a lot of what he had to say, actually. First of all, he by and large endorses the strategy of the organization which I work for, which is primarily focused on bridging uh, the gap between emerging markets and the developed world. And we ourselves see enormous amount of growth in the developed world, whether Jim's numbers are right or directional. Uh, that's still where we see the world growth coming from. And we're fortunate that our forefathers positioned us uh, in such a situation with people like Jim's help to be in those markets, to be well represented in those markets, and above all, to give us those uh, good Scottish values of banking, which really involve taking deposits before you make loans, um, <laughs> <laughs> maintaining a high degree of liquidity, and of course, uh, making sure you charge a fair price to your customers. Um, as well as keeping an eye on your costs. Uh, I would concur with Jim that, that it's very important to me, uh, as I see it, that the United States, despite the difficulties it faces, it will remain a very strong economic power uh, in the rest of my lifetime and many of yours, uh, that it does maintain a focus on education. I think it's key that it does maintain a focus on infrastructure. Uh, I came, first came here 25 years ago from a very impoverished UK, which certainly seems to be going back to what it was when I left now, rather sadly. But when I came to Manhattan, I was impressed by the infrastructure, the quality of the airports, the roads, the buildings. Uh, now when I go to Shanghai or Beijing or Hong Kong uh, or Kuala Lumpur, I sense that maybe uh, here in the United States even we're falling behind. We're certainly falling behind in Britain. Uh, in Hong Kong, it took five years to build a, a, an airport, an island, and about 5,000 kilometers of, of roadway and bridges to, to service it. In the UK, we're still arguing for 20 years about building a third runway at Heathrow. So it gives you some idea uh, of how things can move. It's very important that we remain open to new ideas, though, to new people, and it's equally important that we maintain open, an openness to world trade. So I think it would be a really sad day if the United States reverted back uh, to Smoot Hawley or anything like that. The one area I slightly uh, digress from, Jim, in my thought process is around the uh, pricing of debt right now in the market, particularly the United States uh, government debt. We've seen a backup in the, in the longer dates on the US Treasuries in the last few months. And the question to me is, is that an inflationary fear or is it uh, a sort of Jim Carvel moment where the uh, bond market is, is actually saying, is there much difference between the United States and Spain, for example, in the levels of GDP, uh, of debt to GDP? So time to watch that. We're not there yet, but there are uh, certainly some signs that this is not just an inflationary scare in, in my mind. So, you know, 
uh, on a final note, on behalf of the Council, and particularly to the questioner around India, don't forget you've got the India panel on the 17th of February. Uh, so I know uh, Marshall will be playing a starring role. I can't divulge who the other performers are, uh, but that should be a very interesting event to hear about what's happening in India, a country I'm very familiar with, having led our business there for three and a half years. Very exciting, lots of challenges, and I'm sure that'll be a great programme. So all the very best for the holidays. Thank you very much for coming, and safe journey home on this cold night. Thank you. Thank you.